George Cruz, welcome to the James Smith Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Mate, uh, big fan. I never thought I would ever be sat opposite you in a podcast or anything, really. England rugby player, British and Irish Lion. You've accomplished many of the things that I wanted to as a, as a, as a child, as a teenager. What's it like being a full-time professional rugby player? Fuck. Uh, whoop. Come hey, on. swear, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. Call, um, call anyone a cunt if you want. Well, um, highs and lows. Definitely highs and lows, but like a heap more highs than lows, I'd say. Um, yeah, like you say, like it's something a lot of people would dream of doing. Um, a heap of hard work, like anything. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's like super privileged job. Um, and yeah, pumped to have had, had a career I've had so far. Um, still out in Japan, got a few... Want to win another top league medal, which is um, obviously a highly sought after piece of item. But yeah, good. Like really, really enjoyed it. Um, and it's like the biggest thing for me is like how far and how like how many tours you can go on, how many like friends, family you can meet, how many different memories you can have. And, and that's something which like definitely won't leave me. So fun fact for anyone watching or listening, I played against you before. Yeah. I uh, got absolutely bummed. And so when, <laughs> and that when, was just that was before the game. Yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it was, I was playing in uh, some random London Sevens event, and yeah, uh, yeah. a mate of mine who can't be trusted from uni uh, was like, "Oh, I've got us a gig." Once it was litter picking, he got us a gig litter picking six pound an hour. And when we got there, when the people came into the race course, we left, and then yeah. we came back at the end. It was actually easy money because we just went to the pub. But the second time, he was like, "Yeah, London Sevens, uh, we get to play rugby and work." And we saw we we're up against Saracens. I was like, it's not going to be the Saracens. Yeah, yeah. Then I see the guys in the kit. I was like, oh, this team is wearing Saracens <laughs> kit. It was yourself. Yeah. I remember Noah Cato. Yeah, he, and he was good. He was so, he was Jets. I got bumped. <laughs> like, I, I was already on my way down before I swear I even hit him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, Jackson, fast. back row. Yeah, yeah, very good. I mean, he, yeah, he's a lad who's had... He's probably like 300 caps for Saris now or something. And he is, like, he's been that close to getting England caps. And if I swear if he had, then he'd be, you know, a nice. He's one of those career. players where if I watch him, he's so consistently good yeah, yeah, yeah. at everything. And sometimes yeah, these players almost don't get the recognition. Like you look at uh, in the Welsh squad, like Jonathan Davies. Yeah, yeah. Like he does everything so well. Yeah. And I feel that it, it must be a tough job. And, uh, do you know Richard Barrington? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to uni with Baz as well. <laughs> and uh, He never mentioned that. <laughs> we, we, um, yeah. I remember He's one... a character. That's a man of many, many stories. He is. And he, uh, I think sometimes he likes to tell a story and sometimes never lets the truth get in the way of a good one. It's at least 30% bullshit tax. With yeah. Him. And uh, I always used to have to be careful if he was in my house at uni because my <laughs> stash would go missing. And uh, yeah, all right, so mate. Uh, all right, mate. Uh, <laughs> he comes out in the tightest top. <laughs> Probably one of mine. Yeah. Uh, so I went to Harper College uh, when I was about 21 and realized I wasn't as good as rugby as I thought. Yeah. You, on the other hand, you played, you're from Guildford? Guilford? Yeah, Dorking era. Okay. And then you ended up going to, how old were you when you got into Saracens? Yeah, 18. I probably did it the other way around. You know, like I was definitely crap when I was younger. Um, and really? then Yeah. Like a load of rugby. I played a lot of school and, uh, and at club at Dorking, but like wasn't my main focus. You know, I was, I was very much um, more interested in the, in the social and the, you know, the other aspects. But um, yeah, I, I then got a trial with Saris at like at past the end of the school. So I fin finished school that summer, had a trial uh, and then I got picked up from there which was different. What do you think kind of happened? Was there like a, a maturity process or? <laughs> um, I think, I think I just got given an opportunity and I was like, well, I've got to take this now uh, rather than anything else. Like I wasn't, I wasn't in the firing line to like, you know, you've always got those players who are like, okay, well yeah, he's in Quinn's Academy. He's definitely going to make it into England senior team. And like those sort of like false kind of things. I think there was a lot of people who were in those academies and stuff. And then you just think, oh, well, I would have been picked up by now type thing. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't, I didn't really have my eyes set on being a rugby player or anything. It was more like a mixture of, yeah, I really enjoy rugby. I enjoy the, you know, the, the social side as well. Um, but yeah, I ended up getting a trial. Um, 
actually cut my knee open. I had a one-week trial and they were like, having spoken to the lad since, he was like, no, we were definitely getting rid of you. So I cut my knee open on the last day of the trial and they were like, like it was quite a bad cut. So they had to do all the stuff to rehab me. And then within that, they was like, okay, well, you know, he's, he's making gains in these sort of areas. So let's, let's give him a little, give him 40p a mile, uh, travel around the M25 every day. And then uh, actually, yeah, I was earning more money of the, of, rather than the academy kids on contracts through mileage. We, uh, we did something similar uh, with Berkshire and like we would all say we were driving. You cram like five people <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, car yeah, yeah. and you feel like you're getting paid. And you're like milking yeah. the system. How many miles was that? A hundred? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was just making up miles. But um, no, I literally did around the M25. I started talking around the M25, get there for like, we, we were early back then as well. So it was like kind of get there for 6.37 maybe. And then do go the other quarter, go to Barking, uh, do some training there and then finish up around the other quarter. So I'd do like a looper every like, yeah, three times, four times a week, which was I'm a I'm a big... Nasty. I'm a big kind of fan of the thinking that sometimes you don't pick your sport, your sport picks you. Mm. Where if people have certain body types, it's going to benefit them in their sport. I mean, how tall are you? Six, six. So you're six foot six, yeah. big frame on you. Yeah. It was almost as if put this guy in a rugby environment for five, six years. Yeah. And he's going to be pretty handy. Have you always been a second row? Uh, I was a wing, but then they realized sure. I, I couldn't catch, kick or pass. So um, they just stuffed me away in the second row. But... Um, was there ever like a time you're playing back row? Or? Uh, I have played some some back row games, yeah, but that was probably pretty early on. Second row is a pretty miserable position. It's, it is. It's one of those like, like no one really like cares about it. It is reasonably important to, to get it right, but I think it's, yeah, it's one of those like, hidden ones, really. I think I'm one of the shortest people to ever play second row National League. I don't know. I've played with a couple of short lads in Japan, but... But you, they kind of like, you put your arm around them, their shoulders <laughs> yeah, coming yeah, up yeah, to yeah. it. But then again, if you're wearing, again, there's probably going to be some listeners that don't care that much about rugby. Yeah. Fuck, fuck them. Um, four and five, if you have that on your back. Yeah. And you make a line break or you catch a <laughs> ball by your ankles. Everyone's like, this guy is sick. Yeah, if, you, if you don't wear a contract. Six, six or seven. <laughs> Sign no, him we, up. Ex we expected that from him. Yeah. So at the moment, uh, you're contracted with a club in Japan? Yeah, Panasonic Wild Knights. And how, how is that? Because a lot of players have ended up going over there and everyone just says, oh, it's, it's money. Yeah. Is it just that or is it almost like a top echelon of a rugby career or, or talk us through the decision in going over there? Yeah, like I'd, I'd say a good bulk would be money. Like there's a... There's a um... Yeah, there's, yeah, like I said, there'd be a good group that, you know, can see that, that those yen signs and kind of want to head over. Um, I think for me, like, my brother's been in Hong Kong for 10 years now. I've, I've seen what, like, he's gained out of, you know, being abroad. I've seen what, you know, people like Haskell, they go abroad. They've been to, like, Japan, Melbourne Rebels, and then come back or so. Um, for me, it was, like, at the age of 30, when I was about 20. Seven, I was like talking to a lot of people around okay at the age of 30 I, I need to be doing something else because at this point it's been 12 years in that Saris it, it would have been 12, what, 12 years at Saris and like if you're doing something for 12 years in a row you, you're going to get a bit probably a bit comfortable um, so for me it, like it ticked loads and loads of boxes so it was a case of like I want more time to do business so it's a instead of like 11 month season one month off it's a seven month season five months off so that's a, like a huge benefit there um Good money, ticks, ticks that box. You're um, currently back from Japan now just because your season's finished. Yeah, so I've got the longest off-season I've ever had in my life, which is... That's brilliant. Pretty interesting, yeah. For body, for mind. Body and mind, yeah. Both link pretty closely. Um, because for myself, like, I, I always have, like, my mental time in London, but then mm. I piss off to Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my life there is very chilled, and having that kind of gap of off and on yeah, yeah, yeah. is so important. I think that, like you say, if you were to do 12 years of only having a, a month off... Yeah, it's... it's you it's could, tough, yeah. You're literally just about mending from the season then it's time to go again. Yeah, yeah. Could you go like Prem season, Europeans, then if you're in that sort of setup, you could go, you know, England throughout and then you go on a tour and then like you come back, you're like, well, we go again. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, so, so that, um, but then the bigger one for me is that I'm, I've always been highly driven by like, making memories. I think our, our previous club, Sarri's kind of installed that in terms of, like you, you can win trophies, you can win stuff, uh, you can win games. But like, if you've got decent set of memories, then you know you, you'll have a you'll have something properly to look back on. So for me, it's like I want to I want to experience stuff and rugby. Like 
in the position I was then, like, you know, still international setup, it gives me like a fully open door to go to like a lot of places that, I, you know, if I wanted to go to. Um, so for me, Japan was like, I, after the World Cup, I was like, I, I have to head here. Because even with your, you're with Saracens, you're in like North, North London, you've got to be gravitated to that for training. You've got to be yeah. gravitated to that for games. And then even if you have Six Nations, you go France. Yeah. I'm sure it's very much in their game mode, get out. Yeah, yeah. So what's the kind of culture like or what, were there any shocks when you got into Japan and you're like, well, this is a bit different. No, everything. The whole thing, I feel like, you know, the Truman Show. Yeah. I feel like I've been recorded the whole time. Like every, <laughs> it, it's madness. It's madness, but in such a brilliant way. Like it's like, if you are, I guess, attracted to something different, attracted to like, um, you know, experiencing new new things, then it's like it 100% is for you. If you want like a steady life uh, and you don't want too many surprises, then absolutely stay here and, and keep digging. But um, yeah, it's just like the, the one world is, is different. It's, have you been to Japan? No, I've not been. Nah, it's, you'd have to put it up there. It's 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 really is a different, and the amount of people who have spoken to about this, like it's a different world rather than a different country. There's so much that is different. What, was, what would be like the key things that, you know, when you come home, you're like, mum, dad, you look like, this is what's happening. What, what yeah. would they be? Uh, food. Uh, like this this whole culture between kind of uh, senpai and kohai, so like the senior and the younger. So if you go out for food, then the young guy will pick you up, drive you, but then you'll get there and you have to pay as being the older guy. So like the oldest always has to pay and all that sort of stuff. So it's like, there's like an old school tradition there, um, which is I, I quite like. Um Seeing as I'm an older person now, it's, I don't have to do a lot of the uh, the dog work. But um, yeah, it, like I'd say the food, the culture, just just the the way they are with you. They're very like very pleasant. Very, um, I think being a six foot six tall blonde guy, it, you know, there's a lot of like oh, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but everything, everything's just quite confusing. Everything's like got a little bit of. So like you go to, so me and <clears throat> Hadley Parks went to McDonald's and I was the older one. So I was paying for the lads in the three cars behind. Um, and um, I get up, you know, somehow managed to order a Big Mac on some, you know, on some screen. And and then I give the lady like, it's about 40 or 50 quid to give to the people behind. And I'm trying to explain like money for cars behind. She's like standing there a bit confused. And then she just goes up and puts it in the charity box. I was like, oh, gosh, <laughs> really got this one wrong. So, uh, yeah, it's just like you, you can't, there's no, it's quite hard to communicate, obviously, with language barriers. Um, but then just like the surprise of figuring out what's actually going to come of the communication that you've given them is, uh, is always pretty interesting. Are you learning Japanese? We've got a, a, a Japanese lesson a week. Um, so my, ja my Japanese daijobu. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a, a real like culture shock going into yeah. another country and yeah. having to kind of learn their way of life. It's, it's interesting in Japan, I believe their population is declining. They've got a really old population and a lot of the younger ones, it, they've got some... They're not shagging. They've got some terms for it in terms of, I think it's like, it will come to me, but basically it's it's like, uh, yeah, like meat eaters, ve vegans or whatever. And they, they kind of call some of the men who like have a bit of, I don't know, testosterone about them, meat eaters. And then a, a lot of the people they call vegans or something where like almost they've, yeah, they're not into, I could well be really wrong there, but that's, that's the gist I got where they're not really into, you know, they're more into anime, they're more into um, friends and that sort of stuff. So yeah, they've got a huge elderly population and that they're having big issues with in terms of vac vaccinating them all uh, at the moment. But um, yeah, it's quite... It is interesting. Uh, have you got a missus that you're out there with? Not out there with. Okay. How's that? Yeah, fine. All good, yeah. yeah. There's a, there's like a good chunk of us that have, I think within COVID, either you've got to drop a knee or, you know, you've got to um, just grim and bear it. So there's a good chunk of people who have like partners, uh, a good chunk of single lads. Um, and then there's a few with like, you know, like Hadley Parks with kids and so on. Um, so there's They're a, kind of going away to earn good money, play a good standard of rugby. Mm. And yeah. Then. And like, have a, you know, it is a lot less taxing on your body in terms of, not in terms of like maybe the games, but I mean, some of the games definitely, but in terms of like, you've got three games on, one game off, 
normal season you could do eight games in a row here and, and in a position like mine or maybe like Hadley's you know you could easily bang all those eight, those being 80 minutes so you start to feel that after after a good while so you know having that that break it's like we're talking about mentally refreshing it's you know it's like you can feel the difference you can really feel the difference that's that's one thing I, was, I found quite surprising like um, I even actually saw <clears throat> ladder went to uni with Tom Savage yeah lovely lad yeah, big guy what a as nice well. guy. When I went to Hartbury and I saw him and the size of him, I, then I realised... Who didn't you go to uni with, by the way? Mate, well connected. <laughs> well connected. Everyone's tied back to Hartbury College yeah, in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, top guy. He's yeah. at Centauri. We played against him. He's, he's yeah, got a big ag- fan of him. Again, one of these players that uh, he was captaining Gloucester. Mm. Yeah. And if you were to name, like, say to someone, hey, name 10 Premiership rugby players. Yeah, I'm not sure in many instances his name would come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. consistently makes tackles, hits rucks, yeah. and uh, yeah, decent guy. I saw he was out there, and I was just like, "Whoa, there's there's a lot of players going over there." Mm. And if the lifestyle's better, the money's better, you're getting looked after better. Mm. Surely you're adding some longevity to your career. How yeah. how long do you think that you would be interested in playing out there? Um, it depends. With um, you know, there's there's clearly stuff happening back here uh, in terms of maybe World Cup type of stuff, um, but then I've also got business stuff. So I think for me, it's like uh, my attitude is I want to give myself as many options as possible so then I can choose where I want to be, when I want to be. And I think that's like the ultimate, that coming towards the end of people's careers, that, that should be the ultimate goal um, because there's too many, definitely too many that kind of do two or three years too long with their heads completely not in it. And that's like recipe for disaster post. But um yeah, like I, I, 100% it, it should be an option. It should be an option for, like you look at someone like Tom Curry. He's a hard lad and he is going to always be picked. He's he's always in the in the mixer in terms of all the physical stuff. Uh, and I'd be surprised, like he'd be very lucky if his body, if, if he can do that with his body for the next 10 years, he'd be very lucky. So it's a case of, like, do you ship some players away for, you know, a reduced season, much like a lot of the New Zealanders are doing at the moment. Like within their contracts, they sign a they sign like a three year deal, but one of them post World Cup will be like go away, have a bit of a downtime, come back, uh, freshen up a bit. So like I really like that model. I think that works, especially for some of the top guys who might be playing thirty plus games a year, which is madness. Especially if you're like trying to spread out World Cups and someone's got a 10 year career you could make it 12 and then they can yeah 100% it. yeah so 100%. that in mind England I could be wrong do you rule yourself out of contention to be selected mm-hmm. for the England squad by playing overseas yeah so there's a rule where <clears throat> if you're overseas uh, or if you're not select, if you're not part of a, a premiership club uh, then you take yourself out of the mixer basically is there ever any friction with that from the powers that be where you know you say look I'm going over to Japan I want to you know uh, earn a good living, mix things up, change everything. Do you ever get pushback from, you know, England rugby? They go, oh, George, we're not happy about this. Or, uh, look, I, I, I spoke, I spoke to someone like Eddie, like, like I said, like when I was twenty-seven. So this was all quite pre-planned. So I think with that, it's like there's a recognition that okay, he's probably want to do this to freshen up, to you know, to to put his body in a bit better state. Like I had seven ops leading up into that, so it was like a case of I want to. There's a reason for it. I think there'd be probably a bit more pushback if it was like, okay, let's go grab cash, come back. But um, no, like he was brilliant. You know, he's he has previously coached the Japanese team. He's you know he's he's very well respected out there. Gave us a load of advice around what to do around that sort of area. So yeah, there was no pushback. It was if anything encouragement in terms of like, look, go and grow yourself. Like there's so much that like you live in South London the whole of your life, like. If you hadn't, if you don't go to Australia too much, or you know you haven't done any of those big trips, then you'd be pretty like a one-sided person, I reckon. Um, so for me, it was it was like I had to do it basically. I um, when I was twenty-three, I went to New Zealand to play for a season. Mm. Uh, Club, uh, yeah. So I went to North Otago. Mm-hmm. Then they had six teams. Were they ITM? Are they? Uh, they were below that. So you have Otago, then you yeah. have North Otago, and then. So when I got out there, they were like, right, you're going to a town called Omaru. Yeah. And when you say to a Kiwi, like, Omaru, they're like, what they go, the fuck oh, no, are you doing do there? <laughs> so oh, in a no. really small town, we only had two supermarkets. Yeah. And everyone knew each other. Three teams shared the same car park, right? So you, you had three pitches, <laughs> three teams, and there was a few others. And my one was in an area called Mahino. 
The population yeah, yeah. of Mahino is 60 people. So <laughs> there's about a thousand. 61 when you turn. Yeah, there's about 60. There's probably a thousand sheep for every one person in Mahino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I got to the rugby club and the posts are wooden. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is a little bit different. But playing out there, I remember our preseason, there were no balls. When we got out, I was like, where are the balls? Can we play a game of touch? They're like, there's no balls sheep. here, lads. You're just running. <laughs> and when you went out there and you immersed a different culture, a different way yeah, of doing yeah. things, I dropped a kickoff and the coach was like, right, you're going out there for an hour. You're going to kick the ball up in there and catch it. He was like, just go over there. I'm in a field on my own, just kicking and catching. But for me, just, it almost reignited my love for the sport. Mm. Going over there, wearing a mm. different shirt, yeah. being amongst different people, even being away from home. Now we, we spoke briefly on the way in about not only the longevity of like a rugby career and reigniting the passion, but the fact that there is going to be an element of being a professional athlete where you're like, right, I need to set myself up for afterwards. Mm. What injuries did you have out of interest? Uh, two, um, like ankle clear outs with like chip bone in my ankle and then one on an ATFL on my right, um, like a wrist, a knee, uh, cheekbone, and then a couple of like MCLs. So you get to a point where you, there must be that time where you, you sat there injured at home and you're like, right, like yeah. if this if this goes again, I always worry about this, especially with players that aren't quite as you know successful as as your endeavours with Lions in England, mm. where they could get injured and they might be up six months, they might get dropped by a club, mm. they might not even play in that league again, which kind of brings me on to, you know, you've got a business you've set up four or five. The first time we actually spoke was you were sending me the product and I was mm. like mate rather than me putting this on my story and being like hey mm. guys you know here's some CBD I was yeah, like yeah. come tell me about it if you were to take me back to like the inception point of creating the business why did you as a professional well recognised England and British Irish Lions player decide to start this business um, like 2018 so pre previously club has always pushed us to so Sarah has always pushed you to do like some sort of uni something. So there was a good rule, like kind of before, like a good a number back years back was if you're under 25, you you, know, you have to be doing something, um, you know, and I think they had pretty much 90, 95% of the squad under 25 doing something like a degree or anything. So I've always like been pushed into doing some sort of business bits. Um, and I, I think coming into, so 2018, a lad, uh, the other co-founder, Dom Day, a Welsh international, he was like, uh, he was he got injured, so he got a he had a knee operation in January 2018. I had an ankle operation in February 2018, and then in January 2018, Wada took CBD off the banned substances list. So we we're like, okay, well, part of recovery, let's just give it a go. Um, Dom got good benefits out of like more of like a recovery point of view. I found it helped my, my sleep like loads, and and I know with like everything, we're always pushed towards it. Like, get your sleep right in recovery and, you know, it will do a good world of good. So we got a genuine good benefit case out of it. And out off the back of that, we were like, okay, well, we're at the point where we should probably start looking at something. I guess, I guess just an opportunity arose and we were like, okay, well, there is not enough decent, I guess, tested product in the market. Like for us using a cannabis based product in a, in a tested sport, we we're like, okay, well, let's, let's see, let's look at the options of doing a, you know, doing our own thing. Uh, seeing what we could get at test by. So we started up a company called 4.5 um, and really just got stuck into it. Like loved every bit of it, uh, loved the challenges, like, you know, going up and meeting manufacturers, going all like a load of different things, which like kind of a, an on sort of like just different experiences. And you know, I'd say I'm quite dri driven by experiences, uh, meeting people and, um, and seeing that side of it. So yeah, we, we got a, a really good, Tested product by a um, by a thing called Band Sub um, BSCG, so Band Substance Control Group. So for us, that was like enough to know that there wasn't like you know chemicals and things which are banned within sport for us. Um, and then yeah, it's kind of progressed from there. So we're in we're in boots. We're going into three or four more retailers. Um, we've got like a, a host of really interesting team players on board. Uh, and I know like you got a, a big passion against kind of. Uh, look, here's here's a grand post this blah blah blah. So and and it's I I really um, I'm on the same wavelength with with that. Like everything we try and do is very much around trying to build like a network of how we can help 
people post retirement or, or people wanting to set up stuff. Um, so we've got like a really interesting group of investors from you know um, owners of sports unions or um, head, you know head coaches of international head coaches right the way through to like people who chair boards on you know some of the bigger companies in uh, in the UK and, and globally actually. So like we've got a whole whole host of different people. And we're trying to like link that in with athletes and link that in with um, people who are kind of transitioning. So for me, that's a big, big driver. Um, part of like the the RPA, which is like the Rugby Players Association, to quite like have a, a big hint in terms of player welfare. Um, so that's that idea of being able to create something which is more than just say a product um, for for a decent enough cause is, is something I'm quite driven by. I will be one hundred percent completely open about this that. I at first wasn't a big fan of CBD, mm. probably because I would get it mistake. I do not like marijuana. Like if I mm. get stoned, I've fucked my evening. In lockdown <laughs> in Australia, I got stoned a bit. And every time I got stoned, <clears> I was like, why have I done this? <laughs> I eat uncontrollably yeah, until yeah. I'm literally like, uh, uh, so for listeners, that'd be the psychoactive component of uh, marijuana. And then I actually had an incident last year with a uh, edible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone I was <laughs> And living, you don't really know where you're going with them, apparently. Well, the thing was, uh, we were locked down in Sydney and a mate of mine uh, got some sent over from Canada. And I know that these are strong. My friend yeah, told me yeah, about yeah, one. Yeah. So I've gone out like a surgeon. I've got this like, <clears> they, they smuggled them in a packet of other sweets. I'm like with a knife, use it like a scalpel. I put one of the gummy bears in half <laughs> and I eat it. And then some of the other sweets in the packet, I'm like, oh, these are quite nice. Uh, I didn't realize there were two types of edibles. <laughs> so I've eaten two and a half edibles and I'm yeah. sat there. The other boys have just done a half and I'm looking at them <laughs> and I'm like, guys, are you guys right? They're like, yeah, we can feel it a bit mellow. And I was like, guys, seriously, I was like, how are you not this stoned? And they were like, no, we're fine. And that was pranging me out. I was like, what's going on? I thought I'd be the first person to die from being so stoned. <laughs> so I've then, I've written out a text to um, my like manager who who'd you who, put in the will hey, well I've actually he's in the will <laughs> yeah he, he probably sent them to you the text was like hey mate accidentally took a couple of edibles uh, and I didn't press send on the text it was a text as if to say I've, I've fucked myself so if I woke up all I'd have to do is press send I went I took myself to bed woke up the next day I went to get a coffee and had to go back to bed I was still so stoned so I had that kind of issue but when you first sent me, you actually sent me CBD back in 2019. Mm. I'll be honest, I didn't use it. Yeah, that's fine. Well, but also, give me the refund. Yeah, also, <laughs> I actually gave it to a friend of mine. But at the same time, I don't think I was so focused and obsessed with my sleep. Yeah. 2019 into 2020, was probably, it was the year that I became 30 as well. I started learning more about sleep, the impact yeah. of sleep, the benefit of sleep. And then I became like a bit of a, a sleep fiend. Yeah. Do you listen to the Matthew uh, Joe Rogan? Yeah. Yeah. Matthew Walker, Joe Rogan. That got me a bit twisted as well. I was like, right, I'm going to bed. <laughs> you become obsessed. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And before it was just sleep, but yeah. now it's recovery, it's brain function. Mm. But then almost everyone who listened to that and did the audiobook took it upon themselves to prioritize their sleep. Mm. And they were like, fuck, this is like a superpower. Yeah. 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 And in the years since, I now have to sleep with an aircon unit in my room. So even I got back here in May from Australia. It was freezing here in May. Yeah. I'm moving into my house with an aircon unit. My neighbor's like, what the fuck is this guy doing? It's like 16 degrees. He's still stoned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's still stoned for the edible. And now, right, my pillows, uh, I have a pregnancy pillow, everything. I wear an eye mask. Oh, congrats, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks. The eye mask is, again, do you yeah, yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. mask? Yeah, my, my, my brother's uh, obsessed with them. It's a bit of a what I call a puss repellent. Like, let's say you bring like a nice girl home and you're like, hey, baby, and all of that. And you get into bed. She's like, it's not very alpha that you're wearing a sleep mask. <laughs> Yeah, and a nighty, a pink nighty. <laughs> yeah. It's part, it helps you sleep. Silk pajamas, don't worry about it. But uh, so I've got my sleep set up like incredible, even like caffeine after 2 p.m. I've, I've figured out so much about my sleep. Recently, I started implementing CBD again. Mm. And it's really influencing my sleep positively. Mm. If I piss before I go to sleep, I don't even roll over. Mm. I'm gone for the night. Mm. I wanted to hate CBD so much. I yeah. wanted to go, this is just shit in a bottle yeah but i now see myself probably taking it from here on in mm. and it was because i saw the the almost the fold of athletes that i know that 
aren't endorsed, they're not being mm. paid, mm. and they're nudging me going, mate, you need to get on the CBD. Mm. If I, and now also, I'm, I've looked at how much is like an overdose, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I nail it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I get the weirdest dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I feel well rested. And yeah. the amount of training you can do, recover from, even things like memory and everything else, cognitive function, I think that if people respect that and look after it, they can get tremendous results from it. Yeah. And I also really admire the fact that when you sent me the last package, it came with vitamin D mm. and omega threes. Mm. Like, where did the kind of you're almost like a it's almost like a care package. Yeah, yeah. Where did you get the idea from including those in as well? Um, well, just to go back to your previous point, like there is, uh, I'm there is so much. I think a big thing is why you're probably maybe so repellent at the start is there's so much overselling on it. And I was like, you know, this will cure this, this will do this. And I, I'm like, f- that fucks me off a lot in terms of like a lot of people in, want to get in the industry, get out quickly and like overhype it. But I think there's like a genuine use case for like, much like you say, every day, like a, like a vitamin D3, like a, it will be part of a wellness regime going forward. Um, and I think for us, that's like, we wanted to then create a wellness range, um, and again, like looking at a lot of the stuff we were taking previously uh, in terms of, so pretty much when you're, you're an athlete, you'll be given your vitamin D3, your vit C, like a, a male or, or, fe- or male multivitamin, um, a biotic and, and, uh, and definitely like a fish oil. So we just looked at them and we got some decent nutritionists. So it's not like me and Dom in a kitchen kind of, you know, s- stirring up some pots. We got a really good nutritionist uh, looking at like the breakdown of it. And there's just, again, what came around was like so many overselling claims, like so much, you know, they'll put some, they'll put maybe calcium carbonate in a, um, in a tablet, which is basically chalk. And just for a, like one of those R and, you know, those nutritional claims, like daily amounts, whereas like calcium ascorbate is absorbable, like those sort of like things. So we're just trying, we're trying to go, okay, well, let's take a product make it actually useful uh, and, and have a, a decent enough wellness product. So we've got a range of six at the moment. Uh, we've got some, some more things on the pipeline. But essentially what we want to be able to do is offer a good premium like wellness package to, to whoever wants it really. Since coming back to the UK, I was living for 16 months in COVID-free mm. uh, Sydney. So if we had that like beautiful. If we had 12 cases, yeah, then, like that. guys put your masks on. Yeah. Now COVID's fully locked down because yeah. – they underestimated like the Delta variant. So now Sydney's mm. actually pretty fucked. They're almost yeah. starting their pandemic now. Yeah. But when I got back to the UK, I was like, Have they vaccinated much? 14, I think they're quite 14%. Well, that's quite low. Isn't they it? were at 4% about a month ago. Oh, wow. So they're getting slammed. So they, they shut the borders. Yeah. Last November, we had clubs. So like we could full on party festivals. Yeah. But then it's two weeks in a hotel, no matter what. Yeah. My brother's just gone, um, gone over there. It's, it's pretty draconian, like military at the airport. Yeah, yeah. Don't get to pick your hotel. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Darren, who you met briefly yeah, the other yeah. week, he didn't even have like a window of fresh air. Yeah. Like, and even if you look at like Israel Adesanya, mm. he didn't get to pick. You're like, this yeah, guy's yeah, an yeah. absolute G. And now because they're, it's winter there, the uptake of the vaccine's really low. There was also concerns that even if one in 10,000 people had a blood clot and died, yeah. in Queensland, they only had six deaths to date. Yeah. So the, they roll out the vaccine, they could see more deaths. But anyway, um, when I got back to the UK, I was like, right, fuck, I could get COVID. So I, I've got, it's a joke. I have like my COVID denier starter kit. So every day I wake up, I have my vitamin C, yeah, I have yeah, the yeah. vitamin D from your pack, I have the fish oil from your pack. I started taking creatine for the first time consistently. I've been preaching about it for, for years. For what? For muscle or for? Well, creatine has its uh, cognitive or it has never, co- I've never, I've never indulged in that. I've never, like, I've always heard, I guess, the old school creatine. It was like, kind of like snap your tendons and all that sort of stuff. Or was that just, what, have I just been wild? I think it's like the wives' tale. Like, like yeah. you got that and yeah, you get yeah, strong yeah. too quick and yeah, women yeah, yeah. shouldn't have it. But in essence, uh, we produce creatine yeah. naturally anyway. You should add this to your list of things you do. Um, and it's also yeah. found in red meat. But yeah. one scoop of creatine, you'll get yeah. more than like two kilograms of meat. Yeah, yeah. Now, creatine allows us to recover faster from about some intense exercise. No. So there's that. And it also allows you to store more glycogen in muscles. Mm. So then it will help you with endurance. It'll also uh, make your muscles look a bit fuller because they're storing more water and more glycogen. Yeah. 
Now, if you needed to be light or lighter for something, you might use it in a rugby preseason. Yeah. You get your athletes to drop it. For I, I use it once in a World Cup thing. I started to like bloat a bit. I was like, whoa, let's, let's get, <laughs> yeah. rid of, get rid of this. I'm going to the World Cup. Here. Some people do get like upset from it. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of studies now where people cognitively enhances them when they're sleep deprived. Yeah. Oh, and nice. I think even people that have got concussions, it can mm. help them. And I think it could be Parkinson's or Alzheimer's where mm. now they're looking at heavy supplementation of creatine that's helping people uh, from a cognitive standpoint. Yeah, so yeah. almost everything we look at in literature, as long as your digestive tract can, uh, I could have butchered those statistics by the way, but as long as your digestive tract can handle it, it's fucking good. And we've known this for like 30 years of research. And another one that got a lot of popularity recently was beta alanine. Yeah, yeah. Where it's the one that's renowned for making your face itch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God, it does, doesn't it? it yeah. It, <laughs> you're, you're there. But it's like, if you have it before training, it's nice because yeah, it, yeah. you're like, you tackle someone, you're like, yeah, oh, yeah. scratch the itch. Yeah. This has shown for years as well in research that athletes can perform at high intensity for longer on beta alanine. Yeah, but yeah. people have had this. They're like, nah. They, they, like, they need the magic pill. Yeah. They need something that's going to make them like amazing. But like you were saying, when I wake up, I take your products, uh, take the creatine, take vitamin C, and even we're not that efficient at absorbing vitamin C through drinking it. Mm. So that's why you have such high percentages of it when mm. you nail it. But even that, it's like a, it's like waking up and it's a routine of like respect to mm. your body, to, to who you are. And someone goes, oh, do you want to get a fry up? I'm a massive fan that that first like instillment of looking after yourself changes your actions. And middle of the afternoon, I'm about to have a nap. I have a bit of CBD. Mm. And then before bed, I have my pre-bed routine where I take like a, magnesium, theanine, CBD again. Yeah. Like I said, I'm like a sleep doctor. I've got my eye mask on. <laughs> I'm getting in bed at 9.30. <laughs> like, um, it's, I think it's important for people. And I think that I've never been this pro supplementation mm. person, but I feel it is like, it's both sides. You supplement, you look after yourself better, but if you look after mm. yourself better, you can supplement. Like, yeah. I, I'm saying, I always try and get my, get, get your health through your food. Uh, so for me, that'd be like, I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't go that far. I'd probably pick three or four things uh, and and use them regularly. But it sounds like you, you, you got the whole hog. Uh. Living on my own, I've now got a drawer, like a supplement yeah. drawer. Do you feel like it's too much though? Like to 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 ask other people to do that is that too much? I don't usually ask them to do it because I'm I'm not by any means a behavioural psychologist, mm. but I'm very much a, a big advocate of. With my clients, I'm like, look, this is a good idea. Mm. If you, it, I almost have to sell it to them and I want them to go do it. Similar yeah, to like yeah. you say, hard sales, I don't think work. Yeah. I even think the whole influencer marketing, uh, you know, means of promoting something is dying yeah. as well, yeah, which yeah. is why I was like, mate, come on the podcast. Let's talk about this. Let's talk yeah, about yeah. the inception of it. Yeah. I mean, where do you find that like with your friends and your teammates as well? What was the uptake like when you're like, hey, lads, we're starting a business? Yeah. Um, like to be fair, the, the lads at Sarries, um, and and now I'd say a, a good chunk through the through the Premiership. Um, you know, there, there was currently there was like uh, Al Hargreaves and Chris Wiles doing the Wolfpack. Um, so Wolfpack Lager. So now they've got a place in Fulham, couple in Queens Park uh, beers, uh, and then there was like Tiki Tonga, which was Brad Barrett's coffee company. There was like a, a few others, and you know there was a general interest. Okay, well, look, you know. There's a, there is a, you can gain a lot of contacts within rugby, uh, and like, yeah, let's let's start having a look at this sort of stuff. But um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think we had prepared, especially opening up like a cannabis-based product. We, we'd have prepared for like a, a proper onslaught from like the RFU, from clubs, from that sort of stuff. But like, everyone was was dead open to it, um, and I think like, we'd definitely gone about the right way. We'd informed all the the drugs tested we'd, we'd gone through the rfu we've spoken to the premiership all that sort of stuff so we, we were very much um open about what we're doing um and kind of inclusive because like you see some of the studies <clears throat> graham close was part of a study who's a, a england nutritionist done a lot of other other stuff and like there was i think 20 percent of people in the premiership had used cbd eight percent still continued to use so that's like a that's a pretty hefty a hefty out, out, you know, continuation of, of people using it. Um, and I think for me, that's like, that screams, okay, well, we need more, more knowledge about CBD. We need more education around it. Uh, because if, you know, if there's stuff which, you know, you can maybe offset by taking CBD, 
then then that's that's an absolute win. Um, and you look at like the NFL, they've put a million dollars into funding into CBD, um, you know, around clinical trials around pain and pain management. Like these sort of things, we've been calling the you know the unions of you know the rugby, football, cricket unions to to give a bit of a budget to to look more into this sort of stuff because like you see like a lot of supplements a lot of like maybe more old school bits uh, are kind of coming back in the loop and i think that's that for me is like properly interesting if if we can then offset some of the other kind of practices that we currently go through eight percent out of that 20 that's staggering and that probably is another reason why you're so generous with giving it to people it's like the honey trap Hmm. you're like hey man you're like <laughs> let me get you into i always say about this when i'm marketing anything myself i'm like just download the app man because I'll, I'll catch you in the honey trap yeah uh, data. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i will get your data <laughs> yeah it, uh, eventually you'll get it and if people can even just try it for like a, a period of time if people continue it and it yeah. becomes part of a, a positive you know habit for them then mm. it's going to be great do you ever are you a big fan of marijuana itself uh, I've got to be close to what I say here because I'm still a, a contracted um, professional athlete. Um, but like I said, I, I only joined uh, a professional club when I was 18 and a half. So I was lucky enough to have a, a decent childhood. So you can read into that what you like. It's interesting because um, we had a, an incident recently. We we didn't. But, uh, in America, there was Shaw. Shaw yeah, Cup. Richardson. That's it. And she... Kira Richardson. Uh, that, it, it, it blows my mind that. And, and go on. Sorry. No, 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 no. opinionated about this, but no, go no. On. Tell me, like, I'll, let's see yours first, and then I might catch. No, I just think it's like it's so good that for the first time on a, on a big center stage, you, like this, you're seeing actually you're seeing a reaction around it, and like it's clear, like I mean, challenge me, but it's not going to be performance enhancing, is it? So it, it's it's very much like the people wanting to move to alternative methods of you know, and there's there'll be heaps in the future, all the microdosing, all the, all that sort of stuff. There's like genuine use cases there. Uh, and as long as it's done sensibly, as long as it's like used as part of a practice to try and help, you know, better someone, um, it's not like you you never had you've never had this many people screaming about oh we want to use steroids like it's it's madness. I think um, I think the way she's dealt with that, the way she's owned that as well, like clearly she knows she's done wrong, but she's done wrong for a reason, which you know she's she's gone okay. I'll I'll accept that. So I think with the the changes of of law in medical cannabis and in cannabis throughout like America, you look at like the bigger nations dropping first. So America, Germany is a huge one. Um, so they're, they're like, their use of, of, of prescribed cannabis has, has doubled pretty much every year. So like they're on now over a quarter of a million prescriptions for medical cannabis, which is huge. See, um, I completely agree with all your sentiments, but I do think cannabis yeah. is a performance enhancer because most people require some sort of vice, especially at weekends. Yeah. When you move towards or transition from a busy work week, you need to switch off and unwind. Mm -hmm. People like to alter their state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I believe people even do that with coffee. When they have coffee, they're altering their state of consciousness to go from sleepy to alert and, mm. and you know, cognitively wound for the day. People do it with alcohol when they want to unattach, unwind and drop inhibitions. With marijuana, coming to a Friday night and having that excitement, oh, I want to go out, I want to do this, and smoking a fat joint and sitting on the sofa and fully relaxing. I think that for athletes to be, because if you are in the top 10 athletes in your country, you're wound. Like the, the way successful brains work, I, th I believe mm. in athletes and business people and whatever, you can't just switch off. And if yeah. they can use something <clears throat> like a fat spliff to switch off and fully relax and get a full night's sleep, I believe they're going to get the edge over their competitors. Although you can't say like, oh, there's marijuana in the system. She ran quicker. I think from a lifestyle perspective and a construction of that, I think she would have an edge. Now, even though it was legal in her state, mm. that caused a big an uproar. And I completely agree. Mm -hmm. I support the fact that we're seeing a turn in tide. Yeah. If you're a GB athlete who loves a good zoot, <laughs> loves a big <laughs> fat spliff on a Friday, yeah. and you've just gone a year without a joint because you want to compete, Mm. And they drop the rules for her. You're going to be there, like, come on, where's my where's my leeway? Yeah, okay, but there's so many other stuff you can do this with. So you can sit there and, and you know drink a bottle of vodka and, and get that same thing. So where's the uh, where's the argument there? But then also, like, you can you know you you could have as many cocoa as you like, 
where's the argument there? But for me, it's like the studies, the main studies going around a lot of medical cannabis is chronic pain. So you're, you're almost saying to someone, okay, well, you, you can't use a natural product to benefit your, your you know, to, to help your pain, whereas you can use, you know, you can use a heap of cocodamols, a heap of, uh, you know, paracetamols or whatever. Like what, what's, where's the, where's the crack in that? See, I completely agree with your point here as well, that it's not really, the, the problem is the powers that be mm. surrounding a lot <laughs> of things. And if anything's going to, the reason the Olympics is such a spectator driven event is people want to see people break records. Mm. If you legalize marijuana across all divisions, all countries, because we want to see better rested athletes who then break records, it should be a hundred percent because the reason anabolic steroids are prohibited is because abuse of steroids can cause ailments and mm. it will negate someone's health. I don't think abuse of marijuana, I could be wrong, there were actually excessive use, not say abuse, is really going to cause that much damage because I think we have a confirmation bias with marijuana smokers where there's this narrative that it makes you not, produ not productive, it makes you lazy, it makes you not achieve a lot in life. But I think we're only getting exposed to the narrative that feeds our bias of seeing these people who are low lifes smoking mm. a blunt, or, you know, hitting the bong all day. I love how many <laughs> you know, words I can see. Every in. time you mention it, it's something different. <laughs> love it. Uh, there's just two, a ch I challenge you to keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's two years of my life I don't remember because I was stoned. Um, and then, but there are a lot of super successful people that smoke weed. Mm. Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, like it, it, we only get fed one side of it again with a cocaine narrative. We always see people that squander their life doing cocaine, but actually a lot of doctors, lawyers, well-driven insurance brokers, a lot of successful people use it, but the narrative is always skewed to make people feel it's bad. I see it and I want you to challenge me on this. I think there should be a pro-legalization of all drugs, all of them. I think that human beings, if we have the right to do so much, we should be able to, first of all, legalize MDMA, cocaine, even to a certain extent, heroin, because I think people are going to do it anyway. If people are in a position in their life that they want to do these things, they're going to do it. But what we could do is we can reduce crime we can reduce police resources, but not only that, we can then ensure quality control of these and with the taxable money. I mean, cocaine in London loans about five billion pounds a year. Mm. With two and a half billion pounds, you can set up rehab centers, better education, quality control, because we're leaving not only non-taxable transactions of money, people are going to step on legitimate drugs with other harmful substances, mm, mm, mm. which I think is going to cause a lot of issues. And Pill report on Instagram now do testing kits for like five pounds. They say to people, test your MDMA, test your cocaine, test your ketamine, whatever it is. And people in the comments are like, yeah, I bought MDMA. It's not MDMA. And they're warning people about mm. substances where, you know, people, it's, it becomes more about a turn of profit. There's no legislations or quality control, like you say, about mm. the amount of stuff you'd have to go through to get people to take CBD. So many people in, in London, in the UK, are taking these things with no idea of what they're actually putting up their nose or in their system. Mm. And then I think that, you know, imagine this is what I always say this all the time. If Boris came around today and goes, Hey guys, you can all now legally buy cocaine from these cocaine dispensaries, whatever. Keep in mind, marijuana was illegal and they kept the dispensaries mm. open in the pandemic. Mm. Pubs and restaurants have asked you, if you're going to do cocaine, please do it in the toilet. Nothing would change. Mm. There wouldn't be an uptake in cocaine use because you have cocaine users, non cocaine users. And people do it in the toilet anyway. Mm. Where do you stand on that? Uh, I, I, I think there's a load of decent points there. Uh, I, I definitely think agree on the thing like the quality. Like it would be it would be it be turned into a, a you know a, like a, a an industry which you know people get rated on quality on you know th th that side of it. I agree on that. I think um, I think you know there are countries that are trialing these sort of things. Um, and like you, you know, you might have um, like proper, like I don't know, um, buildings which you can go to and, and trial these sort of things. But I think, I think it, we're well, we're a heap from it. I think the the biggest driver will always be like ta you know, ta the the ability to tax these sort of things um, in in the future. Um, 
It, it's a tough one. It is a tough one because I think there are certain things you you could do it with, um, but it's just it's it's ultimately relying on <clears throat> on the individual to not abuse it. And I don't think like we've come to a point in society where you know a lot of people just don't have control of, on the, of themselves. So. Like how how do you then reinstate that? How do you then go suggest these sort of things? Like you can't put you can, you could you do a you know could you do a okay well you're allowed two lines or whatever like like how and how then do you like can you drive all those sort of things? So there's there's a, there's a lot which is which is highly against it. Um, I think that I, like, then yeah. you have a narrative of uh, if someone ruins their life from cocaine use, makes a headline, makes a narrative. If someone just uses it every big occasion, you know, party, birthday, mm. whatever. Again, you don't get to kind of have that. And Jordan Peterson uh, said on a podcast, I can't remember who it was with, he goes, people ask the question, why do humans do cocaine? And he goes, that's a terrible question. We know why, because it makes them feel amazing. Mm. The question we should ask ourselves is, why don't they do it every day? I believe that human beings have a lot more logic than people give them credit for. The fact that someone can take a substance that, hits the pleasure centers of their brain and only do it in the evening of one night a week. Mm. Some people, yeah, are a little bit carried away. I think that's that's kind of a, an amazing feat. I think we're discrediting a lot of human beings' intellect to, to be logical with these kind of things. Uh, similarly to why so many men can mm. remain loyal on a night out and not try and fuck other women. Like mm. It's there, it's on the table, there's urges to go after it and I still think they don't. But again, you're looking at a very big test mm. experiment and we, we, I suppose we are wandering away into these kind of uh, controversial territories but one drug I'd like to talk about is, is anabolic steroids and its use in rugby now I'm sure you've been in game situations or seasons where you come back and you're like whoa that guy gained quite a bit of muscle in one season well I quite a bit of fat but yeah. <laughs> um, I mean I, I can I can speak I, Honestly, about this, I've never seen it, or actually had maybe like one or two kids from. Like I'd I'd suspect that when they were growing up, pre kind of like pre academy stage, I'd just I'd if I if I was a betting man, I'd say okay, I reckon he's had, he's done a bit, he's dabbled, but I could, I really honestly, from everything I I've seen, and all the teams I've been in, I wouldn't say that I'd I, I wouldn't be able to go okay, I, he's definitely done something. I, I wouldn't. I don't think it happens that much. Um, and I know, I th it, like it could in champ. I, I don't know. Like you see, you do see some huge guys in, in the champ. But yeah, I just think it's too like, I, we go out and we get, you know, I, I, could, I could, someone could knock on the door at 5 a.m. or some people have knocked on the door at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning and you get drugs tested. Like drugs test came around when I was absolutely battered still. Like you just don't, like you, there's just no point in doing it. I think that the easier route is to just work a bit harder uh, and to do, you know, what you need to do in the gym. That's my opinion. Like you'd have been in a different sort of. Like, I wasn't. I, don't know I how... wasn't as good as rugby. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, would you have got tested much? Uh, not really. Rarely. Because uh, we, we can get up tested up to like. So when I announced like, I'm doing a, a CBD um, company, you know, I must have got tested ten or eleven times that year, and on average, you can get tested. I don't know, six or seven times in a year. Do so you like, get tested in your off-season? Yeah, you can be tested off-season, yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that. I, was, <clears> uh, I did a season at Cinderford in that one when I was in Gloucester. Mighty Cinderford. Yeah, God, horrible place. Some, some, <laughs> some fruits around there. And um, I came into the change rooms one day and I was like, our oh, lads, the, the drug testers are here. And the faces on some of the forwards. But that would be more Coke rather than, yeah. rather than anabolic. A couple of juicy players, a couple yeah, of juicy players. Yeah, yeah. My my issue as well with, I would like to probably see legalization in anabolics only because. So I think many, that's a mental statement. Like, but because then you just go on. I'll let you go. On. Okay, if people, so you say right, it is legal, but we support education around it and almost have like a prerequisite education. Not not in sport, not in sport for the record. So yeah, we don't right, okay, we don't right. we don't let people juice up. Yeah, um, yeah, recreational because yeah. we got a lot of guys with Is big, it banned, is it? Yeah. You just so, you, that's illegal substance. It could be just dealing it. Yeah. Maybe having possession of it might not yeah. be quite so bad. But when it comes to uh, altering hormones like you do with testosterone, the reason that people do 12 week cycles is because when you administer high doses of testosterone, your body 
downregulates its production. Mm. I've taken, I've been on gear a couple of times before. Your nuts become like grapes. Genuine. Yeah, because you're you're uh, injecting so much well, they testosterone. They visibly shrink. Yeah, considerably. So they go into atrophy because your testy, <laughs> your testicles produce like the majority that. of your testosterone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there's an abundance in the bloodstream, it's like, oh, we can we can downregulate. Yeah. If you go on cycle longer than twelve weeks, you can run the risk of them never coming back to their full capacity. So you do like a twelve week holiday on gear, but then you need to come off so that your body can upregulate. But what? Okay, what's? Why would you do that? Just so you can look? Is it a vanity thing? Just so you can look? What's the end goal? Is it to look good, or is it? Or do you, or do you want small balls, or what? So like what's, in in twelve weeks? Yeah. Uh, so if you look at a natural person building muscle, every year you pretty much half your ability of what you can grow. So. Uh, let's say in your second year, you could grow 50% of your first. Oh, yeah, yeah. In your third year, it's 25. <clears throat> in your fourth year, it's 12%. In your fifth year, you're working mm. all out for a 6% gain. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. Pretty poor. So, this is if your value system supports just your muscle mass. Mm. And a lot of guys who, I mean, we're very fortunate. I'm six foot, you're six foot six. We, six foot? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I know. No, I'm actually, I'll give you that. Mate. <laughs> I played second, I played second row National League. So like we're we're quite good and we've got rugby physiques, right? Yeah. Big shoulder to waist ratio, whatever. So we're we're pretty chilled. Even when we're a bit soft, girls are like, oh, you know, I'm dating a rugby player, whatever, you're safe. You're five foot eight. All you've got is your rig. And small balls. <laughs> small balls. You know, like you go so let's say say you you love training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gym is your life. Yeah. You're in there, I'm only joking about people that are five eight, uh, kind of. You've changed your whole life. You've started seeing this diminishing return. You've just spent a year going to bed at 8 p.m., waking yeah. up at 6, yeah. training twice a day, yeah. hitting your protein shakes, everything, and you've not seen anything noticeable. Now you are going to be led down the path, and I don't encourage this, but you're like, I'm going to go on gear because I've lost love of my training. It's mm. like your little trip to Japan. They get that, but they get their life the same. Mm. In that 12 weeks, you grow a staggering amount of muscle. Your superhuman recovery. I'm talking... My biggest issue when I was on gear was I didn't know when to leave the gym mm. because I just did not fatigue. <laughs> my deadlifts and my squats were increasing significantly week on week. I felt amazing. I was like a dog with two dicks. Like your sex drive, your mood, your aggression, not like you want to fight, you wake up, you're mm. like, let's get shit done. Because testosterone is a very good feel good drug. But the issue here is that people do the 12 weeks. You can buy mm. 12 weeks of testosterone for like 80 quid. But now you're in a position where you need to manage yourself properly to get back to baseline. And this yeah. is what's called PCT, post-cycle therapy. Now, PCT is more expensive than your cycle. Mm. Now, I That's was very... Hook. Yeah, this is it. That's the subscription. <laughs> so if someone goes, oh, I want to get big, I, you just sell them testosterone. That's what's happening in gyms. Yeah, yeah. But then people aren't aware of this post-cycle therapy. Now, I had to take a drug called Pregnal, which is what they give to little boys when their balls don't drop. So I had to take that, right? <laughs> I then had to take breast cancer medication so I didn't develop or to ensure that I didn't develop gynecostia, which is... Moves. Yeah, guys, when they come to uh, the end of their cycle or even in cycle, if there's too much testosterone, the body will convert it to estrogen. So guys are getting sensitive nipples, going on forums, and because it's all illegal and you can't really talk about it, they say, a friend of mine has sensitive nipples. What should he do? And the other person saying, a friend of mine needs to take this. But I'm pretty sure it's something called prolactin. Anyway, they start developing breast tissue because of it. They're uncycled. They've taken such huge amounts of testosterone. They're now growing breast tissue. They have to have operations to have that out, but most guys don't know what's going on. So you've got a guy, six months post his cycle, he's got sensitive nipples to the point they have to tape them when they play sport. Like even rugby players have had to tape their nipples because they hurt that bad. They're having to... Um, They've got no sex drive because they didn't take anything to get their testicles re-regulated and back to where they were. They didn't take the breast cancer drugs. There's so there's this huge kind of... I went to the doctors on cycle once and asked them about something and the doctor couldn't give me a response because it remains taboo. It remains yeah, yeah. underground. I go, uh, hey doc, you know, uh, I'm taking an aromatized inhibitor and he's like, I don't know what that is. And I was like, but you're a doctor. And he was like, we don't get taught this stuff. So with me for recreational use, I would like to see a, a legal, uh, some kind of legalization of it only because then we could have centers, quality control. Because again, these are people in kitchens yeah. mixing up testosterone yeah. batches and selling it to young lads at the gym. You know, if we could have these like drug places where you go in 
And the doctor goes, are you sure you want to do this? We're going to do a psych evaluation to make sure you're not mental. Yeah, like, and that's the thing. Like, surely it just comes back to like, what the fuck have we become? Like, why? What's the necessity to do testosterone? It is then surely like, what's the end? What's the end goal? A va- it is a vanity thing. So, was your end goal? You wanted to be bigger at that point in time. I wanted to be taken seriously. I was a personal trainer. Yeah, just started out. Like, even having a rugby physique, not many PTs have done well with a rugby physique. I looked at mm. the top ten people in what I considered the UK fitness industry, all shredded, all jacked. In my mind, I thought these guys were natural but super smart. So mm. I was like, how can I catch up with these guys? How can I have a chest for the first time in my life? But then I realized that the whole UK fitness industry that I was in is full of people on steroids. And even if you look into, you know, look at The Rock. You're telling me The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, gained more muscle between 30 and 40, and then between 40 and 50, gained more muscle. Yeah, you just did a bit more, bit more bench press. A bit more gear, a bit more gear, A bit more bench press. Like, you're, after 30, you yeah. start to see a natural decline of testosterone. Now, in Matthew Walker, they talk about, it's about 1% from 30, they're on in. Mm. But if you're sleep-deprived, you see up to a 10, 15% drop, which is why they mm. say you can age 15 years if you're sleep-deprived. But I am very pro as well, TRT, which is testosterone replacement therapy. Mm. So let's say you get to 38, 39, and you'll start, you know, CBD is not cutting it anymore. You're, you're waking up and you're like, oh, I've lost aggression. I've lost the mood. You know, my sex drive has dipped a bit, which can happen to, mm. I'm not saying you will, you're an athlete, but for, for mm. certain men, they can go to the doctors, have their blood works done and get given a small amount of testosterone mm. to mimic like a 21 year old. Yeah, so for me, that's that's like a, there's a use case. It's not just based around a vanity thing. Like, I think it's much like so you, say, you say, well, you could use medical cannabis for chronic pain. Like, there's a use case for that, and therefore, like, it's it's a bit like the individual has a, a guide of what and, and so on. But I think when you get to a point where okay, well, I want to take testosterone because I want to look better. Uh, I want to be taken more seriously. I I think that's a vanity thing. And I think that then that needs to either be called out or just, yeah, like sorted out. And that's more of a society. That's where I think like opening up drugs to everyone, that's where it could spiral because like there is so many people with so many like mental health issues, vanity issues, like those sort of like driven by, I don't know, your social media type characters. That's what I think is the issue rather than, and that's where things can spiral, rather than genuine use cases for stuff where, you know, it can be prescribed, it can be talked about sensibly by people who know a lot more than we do or aren't pushing something for the, for the basis of, you know. Again, I completely agree with your points. However, I feel that there are very stupid cycles people are going on now because mm. there's no one they can go to. If it was legalized and you went somewhere, they go, look, 400 milligrams, that's too much. We'll put you on this. Like there, there's yeah, someone they yeah. can talk, where it's not mm. taboo, where their doctor goes, I'm not, I don't want to talk about it. Mm. Um, interesting you say about mental health. I do believe that people that abuse steroids mm. do put themselves, because I've had low testosterone, I've come off cycle before. It's not nice, but it's only two weeks. And that kind of lack of like desire and willpower and aggression. Also the fact I went to the gym and I was losing strength and size. There's nothing I could do about it. Mm. This is the reason that I, I actually said to people, Hey, I've done it. I don't think you should do it. I've done it. I was in the negative feedback loop of getting bigger. Mm. I actually ended up doing CrossFit afterwards where I could perform in training and it not be about how I look. Mm. Mm. I got very much stuck in this yeah. vanity trap. And yeah. I was like, this is not good for my mental health because there's also never a finish point for these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like there's always someone bigger. Like, yeah, there's always someone bigger and better. Better genetics, better cycle, yeah. doing more blood works or whatever it is. Um, but I believe as well, there's a big correlation with testosterone and mental health in men. Mm. And I think that if people neglect their you know, own production of testosterone through neglecting sleep, where CBD is a great like, player in that, uh, neglecting composition, mm. like, let's not tiptoe around the fact that the more obese you are, probably the less testosterone you're going to produce. Mm. And again, no one's really having these kind of discussions with people. We've now almost got this body positivity thing going, hey, you can be you can be really overweight and still fit. Mm. Um, not enough sunlight. A lot of guys just work in fluorescent offices. Um, and it's something that really shouldn't be fucked with. So like TRT, you're on board. But with the kind of anabolic vanity stuff, it's difficult because women 
you could argue do the same when they have breast implants, Botox. Oh, don't leave that one out. <laughs> you understand? That? No, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. And but your point but before, the fix surely is like okay, well, it's small. It's changing in small habits. It's decisions, and and I think in COVID, a lot of people have realised. Oh, I don't want to be stuck in an office. Oh, I don't want to be doing this. Oh, you know, a lot of people have changed a bit in that in that sense. Uh, and surely it is like, yeah, I guess it's education and, 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 and then small habit changes off the back of that. Like nothing quickly is going to work, is it? So what was, what was your, uh, kind of COVID experience revelations? Did you get COVID at all? Uh, yeah, I think I had it early doors post six nations. We, uh, the six nations got canceled. So we nipped out to Dubai for a week. Um, and that was loose. Uh, and we were like kind of, you know, like those cherubims in, in the fountains, we were like, Spitting water in the in the in the pools in Dubai, and then uh, like we get we get back and we hear that Dubai is like riddled with COVID, and then we were like sick in bed for a week. So I'm pretty sure I had COVID then. But um, uh, I think for me it was like just I think we were lucky enough in Japan that we could get out and do do a fair chunk. Um, but like for me, probably the ability to just be on my own for a bit was like you know. I felt I'd grown in that set in area. I think, um, like, there's a lot of the time when you know you're around people twenty four seven, you crave that sort of attention and you crave that sort of um, you have to be always doing something. I think the ability to learn that to you know just to sit back a little bit and and I think that that was a good good learning curve for me as well as going to Japan and doing that trip kind of mainly solo. So um, yeah, I, I think that was a big thing from from COVID for me. I've still swerved it so far. This is it. I'm, I'm yeah, part of me. Did well. Part of me is like, just get it, just get over it. <laughs> you know, like deal with it. The yeah. other side of me is like, uh, I think I'm, I don't. I'm, I'm you might pro- have had it already, though. No? I've, you- I've not really been ill for like two years. Yeah, but there's loads of people like, loads of people who you know, are, well, asymptomatic. Funnily enough, in Sydney, I had the first cold. This is when there were like literally zero cases in transmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a cold where I did lose my sense of taste but it was just a cold and there was nothing in circulation but I was almost scared to yeah. get tested because of, imagine yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. the first person in Australia that gets COVID in six yeah, months stupid Brit they were like fucking, fucking yeah, this dickhead has <laughs> fucking done us in this dickhead with, on testosterone with small yeah. balls got yeah. <laughs> with fucking <laughs> grape nuts um, so what does like what does the future hold for you your business what kind of things are you looking to work on in the coming months and years uh, so three months I've got three months left uh, back home and then I'll go back to Japan for seven months uh, do you have to quarantine when you go back I think it's six days at the moment in a, in a government hotel which isn't which isn't too bad uh, but these you know these change, things change every ten minutes so um, I'm going to go to Ireland for a bit check that out um, and but mainly business I'm, I'm properly head down in terms of like I'm highly passionate about um, about my, my off field bits uh, and that's like that's got me hooked like the ability to be able to speak to, um, you know, the, the heads of Grenade, the heads of you know, um, the Hut Group, those sort of people, like, as a, I'm very privileged, I know that, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the contacts sometimes like we can try and wangle to speak to. So on that side, um, I'm really enjoying that, getting a load out of that from personal growth, but also, you know, business growth as well. Um, so big focus on that. Um, we've got a, a few interesting bits coming out with... Um, with four or five um so just trying to organize that uh, and just trying to see as much as family as possible and friends you know it's it's a good reminder when you you know you got a bit of time off because i for for 12 years would have been pretty much every weekend there's something happening apart from like a you know a five week four week off season in which case you're pretty much out of the country so the ability to you know go to weddings the ability to you know, see family to, to pre pre plan stuff is, is I've, I've really enjoyed that. Do you have uh, it's quite a personal question? Do you have mm-hmm. a, an ambition of re- like a time frame retiring from rugby? Do you see like, is it maybe another world cup? Is it, mm. is it what's kind of in, in your mind with that? Is there ever like a, a get out age where you would want to get out without any more injuries? Like yeah. I, I just want to understand like the psychology of that. Yeah. I, look, I think everyone's ideal would be around like a 32, 33. Like I think the ones that kind of play to 35, 36, they're, they're either body is in incredible shape, which is 
one thing yeah you so you can continue but a lot of them are like their bodies in bits but they kind of they've probably bitten off a bit too much in terms of mortgage and kids and whatever so they need a they need to fuel that and they'll go for you know they'll go for those kind of those cash deals which they don't really want to do but they have to so my 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 goal is not to have to do that um so business is going well um uh, and yeah i'd like to i'd like to have my next season in japan and then most likely come back uh, ideally play for saracens and and see if i can do another year with uh, with the with the world cup in, in in a little bit of mind um but yeah i'm i'm definitely keeping options open um but yeah my my main goal is just want to i want to i've now come to a point where i want to enjoy every experience i want to do so if it's like okay you might not enjoy that then i just won't do it um for me that's that's important. I want to want to do it rather than be, oh, I could do this, should do this. I suppose that's a testament as well to getting into the business side of things so young mm, and yeah. not waiting until everything's kind of crashed because there are even people I know that one of the best things that ever happened to me was not being that great at rugby. Like, it, you know, yeah. I, I never hit that cusp. And for me, that was like, okay, 23, yeah. go get a proper job. Yeah. Like, go stop being this guy who plays for the weekend you know, nat three, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, get into life. And you're very fortunate you're in that top end. You have the clarity as well to see, okay, I'm at the top of my game. I'm playing pretty much the highest level in the world, but I'm going to set some foundations mm. in, in place. There are there a lot of people in that kind of mid tier, like you say, that are kind of just still chasing it, mm. still think they're going to get their breakthrough. And if they don't, they're going to probably be in some kind of existential crisis. Yeah. Like the, the stats, and this isn't this isn't just rugby alone. Like, like you look at some like stats from cricket uh, as well, but across across sport, the cliff edge of retirement, like it's there's high higher rates of, of suicide, dramatically higher rates of suicide, depression, divorce. Like they're all real stats. They're not just like they're not just things that are you know made up. These are things which are happening to people, and you know left with big mental health issues off the back of like losing that. I don't know sense of being part of a, a pack or part of a, you know, a team or... It's been, purpose as yeah, well. Yeah, being right? part, being, I guess, looked up to because the, the, as soon as you pretty much finish, like, you are pretty much out of the door, which is how, how it should be. And I'm, I'm not debating that. I think you just have to be prepared for that. And I think for me, it's about how can I put myself in a position so that, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm ready for it. So I don't have those, that sort of like wondering mind in terms of, oh, look, this is creeping up on me, that anxiety of, of everything and then obviously the, the the cliff edge sort of fall from from grace i think it's great that you don't just attach your purpose as george cruz england rugby player mm. british Irish line you're like i have that but then george cruz business mm. cbd helping athletes sleep better get fitter be recovered better mm. and that allows you to transition from one to the other rather than just falling off uh, the edge of the cliff um from me well, actually from yourself anything you could plug plug away you know, this is your space. You can have your time. I, I get really awkward about plugging, so uh, that's as, as as pluggish as I can get. Um, no, nah, just look. I think if you're gonna try CBD, try it from at least a company that has got like test results on their website, all those sort of bits. Uh, do a bit of digging around it. Um, again, don't fall for like you know it's gonna cure the, the world. It's, it is a supplement, I think, along with you know, like you talk about a, a, a steady regime, which you can you know you can implement and and be part of something. Um, so that's yeah, that's that'd be my 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 take on it. Um, but yeah, create some memories. That's that's the, that's the one thing I think people should be like. Definitely the one thing from from COVID. I, I think a lot of people have seen is like a big eye opener in terms of like it is short. Whatever you're doing is short. So like you, let's I don't know, find stuff you want to do. You see, I've I've got so many mates who've like gone. No, I'm leaving my job now. I'm doing something else. I mean, granted, if everyone's setting up businesses, you know. I think the failure rate is seven out of 10. So there'll be some shortfalls in there, but I think the fact that, you know, a lot of people are trying and doing stuff is, is pretty heroic. Thank you for coming on. I wish you the best of luck. Enjoying your time in the UK, going back to Japan, coming back to Saracens yep. and in the next World Cup. So thank you very much for being on and people uh, do check out 4.5 CBD uh, and get involved in George Cruz's honey trap. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, mate.